Hello, I'm Jo. I'm a teacher at Twinkle. This is the fourth in a series of five videos where we're reading an ebook called How to Skin a Bear. In the story so far, V, the youngest member of a Stone Age tribe, has sprinted off into the dark storm in search of her dog. Having found herself completely lost, she hears the howling of a wild animal behind her and runs for her life. She falls into a hole. She can still hear a beast snuffling and whining nearby as she struggles to get away. And she climbs over a tree trunk. She falls in some mud. She hides in a nook in a rock. And it is then that she discovers that it's actually a dog that is licking her rather than a wild beast. And that's how we left me at the end of chapter three. Delighted to have found dog, I expect. This is chapter four. Now, in chapter four, we're going to be looking at how, um, writers, how a writer structures a story. Now, when we talk about the structure of a building, we mean the way that it's constructed, how different parts fit together. When it comes to pieces of writing, structure also means how it's put together, how it's organised. In its simplest form, we talk about the structure of a story being having a beginning, a middle and an end. But there are lots of different things that we can explore about the structure of a story. For example, one of the things we'll look at today in the chapter is how the author links back to things that have happened before to kind of join the story together. Let's read chapter four. It's called A Scrumptious Crunchy Feast. Dog is wet and muddy and he smells worse than our tent after the tribe ate rotten horse meat. But he's here. He sticks out his big pink tongue and licks my mouth and nose and hair and the sore bit on the back of my head where I fell. Then he flips onto his back for a belly rub. I ruffle his fur up and down until I'm too tired to move. I rest my head on his grey furry tummy and even though I'm lying in the dank sloppy mud, far from my tribe I feel cosier than a bee in a hive. I'm so cosy that my eyes slip shut and I slide into a dream. So already where the author's mentioned the saw bit on the back of Bee's head, that links back to her hurting her head in chapter three. I dream that I'm chasing after a great beast in the dark. I've got spiky hair and a mud smeared face, just like the elders when they go hunting. I'm running, running, running with a spear in my hand, and I can see the beast up ahead with pointed teeth and a mouth like a sinkhole. I wake up cold, shivery and lonely. I need to find my tribe. Dog stands outside the little cave. In the bright daylight, he looks wolf-like and muscular. His giant pointy ears swivel and his wet nose twitches. Dog is the best hunter in the pack which is another reason Dad should never have told me to leave him behind. If anyone can lead me back to the tribe, it's Dog. Dog stares along the stone passageway. I wonder what Doggy thoughts he's thinking. Weird smell, tasty smell, fishy smell, yucky smell. Dog yips and my tummy rumbles. I'm so hungry that I could eat my own leg. Come on, Dog, let's find breakfast. Yip, says Dog, which might mean yes or it might mean that he's still smelling peculiar things in the cave. I scramble from the cave and dog sets off. Now at the top of page 28, we read about B having a dream. And that's happened before in the story too. And it's something that the author uses to link parts of the story together. When we have that repetition of her having a dream and then waking up. Look on page 28. Can you find two examples on this page of B linking back to earlier in the story by mentioning the tribe? Pause the video and write your answer. Well, on page 28, she mentions the elders hunting when she's talking in her, about what happens in her dream. And also when she's describing what a fine dog dog is, she links back to reasons why she should have chased after Dog rather than leaving him behind. Let's read on. Back 
to the top of page 29. As we tramp through the passage in the rock, I think of feasting with the tribe. Fresh horse liver and roasted nuts, steaming fish with the skin on and sharp berries. It makes me miss my people even more. Well, except rat, obviously. Eventually, the floor slopes upwards and the light gets brighter. We're climbing out of the passage and into a dense green forest. A forest with trees and leaves and bushes, with nuts and berries and insects. A forest that I don't recognise. Food first, I say, then we'll find the tribe. I have to act like an elder now, it's only me and dog. Yip, barks dog. He seems to have a plan. I follow him through the trees. We walk for an age. Suddenly, dog stops and yaps. Beside his muddy paws, I spot bright yellow flowers with spiky green leaves. Dandelions, I cry, a scrumptious, crunchy feast. You are a good dog, dog. I throw myself onto the soft ground beside him. As I rip up the juicy green leaves, my belly roars with hunger. I stuff the dandelions into my mouth. They're crisp and tangy. The creamy sap melts on my tongue and bits of soil add a surprising crunch. Yummy. After finishing the remainder of the weeds, my belly is still grumbling and something is tickling my hand. I look down. Crawling across my fingers is our main course. Ants. Hurriedly, I lick the insects off my fingers and carefully crunch them between my teeth. They crackle and burst with sour juice that makes my mouth zing. Yum, I bet there's more nearby, I say to dog. On all fours, I run along the ground after the marching ants. I find their nest and grab a sturdy stick. Then I plunge it into the ant hill. When I pull it up, it's crawling with tiny ants. I'm so hungry, I slurp the ants right off the stick. Dog leaps around me, barking. He's hungry too. I plunge the stick into the nest again, and this time I let dog lick it clean. Delicious! Many sticks later, finally full, I sit and dig spindly ant legs out from between my teeth with my fingernail. I'm thirsty, dog. Do you know where we can find some water? Yip, yip, says dog, which might mean yes, or it might mean that he's got ants crawling around in his belly. He skips off uphill. You're going the wrong way, dog, I yell after him. Water flows downhill, not up. But dog ignores me. He happily bounds away. Dog, I call, but he keeps bounding. Dog, he leaps and skips between the trees. Dog, I yell as loud as I can. I can't even hear him anymore. Fine, I sigh. I don't know how, but dog is usually right about these things. I take a deep breath and sprint after him until I finally reach the top of the hill. Up here, there are no trees, just grass and rocks. Dog stands proudly, his fur sticking up in the fierce wind. Dog, why are we? Whoa! I spin around on the spot. This is incredible. I'm so high up, I can see to the ends of the world. To the east and south, I see rolling hills and trees. I look north, expecting to see more of the same. But instead, I see a wide patch of cleared forest. Smoke curls from three or more fires. Dogs run about herding goats, and people herd the dogs. There must be twice as many people as in my tribe. I've never seen so many people and dogs and goats and fires in one place. Dog yaps and curls around my legs until I turn west. Glittering in the light of the sunset, a long eel shape twists through the trees. That's the Pig Lick River. I start to jig on the spot. You did it, dog. We're going to find the tribe. The river is called the Pig Lick because there are always wild pigs near the banks. We hunt them while they're busy slurping up the cool water and rolling in the mud. The Pig Lick River is the last landmark on the way to the Rock of the Long Sun. The Rock of the Long Sun is like a, a three-legged mammoth with no head. It's made of giant heavy stones and is a really old monument. On Midsummer's Day, the sun sets between the legs of the stone structure, and when it does, the elders all do a special ritual. I'm not allowed to join in, obviously. Okay. 
Why do you think the author mentions that B is not included in the ritual that the tribe do on Midsummer's Day? Write your answer down and pause the video. Well, you might have written down, I think the author included this detail to remind the reader that B was not included in the ritual that happens be happened before. So it links back to earlier in the story. My tribe might be sitting on the bank of Piglick River right now, feasting on a sizzling boar. Come on, dog, we need to head that way, I say. I swing my arms and set off down the hill. Behind me, dog whines. I stop and turn. Dog yips and disappears. Ah, oh, what now, I moan. This is incredibly unfair. When dog knows the way, I follow him. But now that I know the way, dog won't follow me. I plod uphill much more slowly. When I get to the top, I still can't see dog. Dog! Yip, yip, he says, surprisingly close by. I climb onto a jutting rock and then I see him. He's found a cave. Not a piddling little bite out of the rocks full of squelchy mud like the one that we slept in yesterday, but a proper cave with a high roof and a rock floor. It's big, dry and out of the wind. It's the perfect place to stop for the night, even if it is a bit of a mess. Dog is busy. He runs about sniffing scattered objects and dark stains on the cave floor. I follow Dog inside. The middle of the cave is black from the ashes of many fires, as if a tribe lived here before. Charred logs litter the ground. On the walls are painted shapes like leaping deer and horses drawn in red and brown. They're all running in the same direction like they're being chased. The pictures are flaking and faded, as if they were painted years ago. I take a small step towards the gloom at the back of the cave. Crunch! My bare foot is met by a hard, and cool something that stabs into my sore skin. I reach down to investigate and pull out the splinters. I feel something smooth and round and holy. I pick it up carefully and carry it out of the cave and into the light. I gulp. It's a human skull. That last bit, I gulp, it's a human skull. Why does the author choose to put this as a paragraph on its own on the page? Write your answer down now and pause the video. Well, these two sentences on their own works well because it draws attention to the sentences to show they're important. It also raises tension. The reader wants to know more. But there is no more in this chapter. It makes you want to read on and lots of books are structured in this way where there's something at the end of a chapter that makes you want to read on. It's a cliffhanger, it makes you want to read on to the next chapter. Well, that's the end of chapter four. There are more questions and activities that you can do after the video. Just click the link in the description below. Join me next time for chapter five. Bye now.